which would have been an exposure of this Carnegie Endowment story and the Ford Foundation and the Guggenheim and the Rockefeller Foundation, all working in harmony toward the control of education in the United States. I believe, first of all, that we now need nothing short of a world constitution for the global financial system. This is a global economic crisis. All they're doing, country after country, is dumping money into the problem, and it's all falling on the taxpayers' back. We're it is a move against truth. It is a move against meaning and a move against certainty. There's no such thing as truth. You cannot find meaning in life, you've got to manufacture it yourself, and you can't be certain about anything. But they obviously are certain about no meaning and certain about no truth. So they bring in that certainty to suit themselves. Now, there's no truth, no meaning, no certainty. There's another aspect to this. They take away from the author the prerogative of fusing words with his or her own meaning. So if you write a book, the postmodernists will read it and deconstruct it to reinterpret what they think you ought to have said or what they want to make you actually say. I believe you and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee. And the message that I am bringing you is clear. It is concise and there can be no mistake in its interpretation. You must wake up now or be enslaved. The war has begun many years ago. The war was declared by our enemies upon us. You had better listen. Her externalization of the hierarchy and she tells us that in place of Christi Christianity the mystery of religions will be restored by the church and Freemasonry. Many of us Christians are not afraid to be thrown into prison because we realize that we are free in Christ no matter where we are. And they are the slaves, no matter where they are because they're slaves to sin. History. Man has waged war, conquered and enslaved countless cultures and peoples around the world. The world seems to some to have no direction, that there is a sense of accident about history in the cycle of world events. Historical figures such as Hitler, Mussolini, Mao, Stalin and many others seemingly rise to power in a political and philosophical vacuum. At least that is how our schools present these events. Is this true? Or is there a pattern laid in a planned direction? Is there a plan for the current direction of our world? We shall have world government, whether or not we like it. The only question is whether world government will be achieved by conquest or consent. James Warburg, 1950. Bush has had the knowledge in the background and has had the posts. As president, he will be in a better position than anyone else to pull together the people in the country who believe that we are in fact living in a one world and we have to act that way. David Rockefeller on George H.W. Bush, 1988. Before us, the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be. We have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations 
can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. We're living through exceptionally difficult times. The financial crisis and its dramatic impact on employment and budgets, the climate crisis which threatens our very survival. A period of anxiety, uncertainty and lack of at his first press conference as the new president or the appointee, uh, Mr. Van Rompuy declared that the Copenhagen process would be a step towards the global management of our planet. Yet these problems can be overcome by a joint effort in our, and between our countries. 2009 is also the first year of global governance with the establishment of the G20 in the middle of the financial crisis. Told that when we had a president, we'd see a giant global political figure. The man that would be the political leader for 500 million people. The man that would represent all of us on the world stage. The man whose job was so important that, of course, you're paid more than President Obama. Well, I'm afraid what we got was you. The climate conference in Copenhagen is another step towards the global management of our planet. And the question that I want to ask, the question that I want to ask, that we're all going to ask, is who are you? I'd never heard of you. Nobody in Europe had ever heard of you. I would like to ask you, President, who voted for you? And what mechanism? Oh, I know democracy is not popular with you lot. And what mechanism uh, do the peoples of Europe have Mr. to remove President. you? It's talk a little bit about what I have seen in video from you, Lord Monckton, about this. This is the, uh, the Framework Convention on Climate Change. Explain what this is first. Right, this is an agreement that was reached many years ago by about 190 countries have now signed up to it. And the idea is that we are screwing up the planet with too much CO2, right. and therefore uh, we have to do something about it. Now, what is now coming up at Copenhagen at what will be the 15th meeting of the state's parties to this convention. 190 countries in Copenhagen from December the 7th to the 18th. There will be a conference at which the treaty which you now have in front of you on the desk there will be signed unless you and everybody watching can stop it. And okay. that treaty, among other things, says there's going to be a world government. May resolve itself in some type of a, of a global currency crisis. And then, if the global currency crisis unfolds, then inevitably you get, uh, I guess, an alignment under a, a global world government, uh, a new global currency, um, and a new world order. Uh, so, we may be moving. To As more and more people become aware of a plan for a world government, anger swells in the heart of many grassroots movements across the globe. Well, this is happening as the elite become more and more overt in their tactics. The elite, including banking families that control many of the world's central banks, such as the Federal Reserve and other banks around the world. This fact was supported by historian Carol Quigley, who in the 1960s was a Council on Foreign Relations insider. In his book, Tragedy and Hope, he states, The powers of financial capitalism had another far-reaching aim, nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. This system was to be controlled in a feudalistic fashion by the central banks of the world, acting in concert by secret agreements arrived at in frequent private meetings and conferences. The apex of the system must be the Bank of International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland, a private bank owned and controlled by the world's central banks, which were themselves private corporations. Carl Quigley, Tragedy and Hope. The 9-11 truth movement has gained momentum enormously as the mounting evidence of the truth of that day comes to light. It's as close as we can get to the base of the World Trade Center. You can see the firemen assembled here, the police officers, FBI agents, and you can see the two towers. A huge explosion now raining debris on all of us. We better get out of the way! Shows such as the Alex Jones Show continue to gain in listenership and are fast becoming the new mainstream in America. Many believe that a mass awakening is on the horizon and that the world as we know it is about to change dramatically. Where is it all heading, you may ask? 
in the direction of truth or into the path of the adversary. Luciferianism is, and continues to be, the ruling class religion since the time of the ancient mystery and fertility religions. It is also the first lie Satan sold to the world through deceiving Eve and then causing rebellion in Adam, the lie that we can become gods. In Luciferianism, God, the Heavenly Father of all redeemed born-again believers in Jesus Christ, is vilified and Lucifer is exalted. These mystery religions have continued today in Freemasonry, Skull and Bones, and through also the Jesuits and the Catholic Church. But it is also in almost every aspect of society. So much so that someone sold into the spiritual blindness offered by the Luciferian philosophy in its many forms will not even notice this happening. On the subject of Luciferianism, Philip D. Collins states the following. Luciferianism is the product of religious engineering, which sociologist William Sims Bainbridge defines as the conscious, systematic skilled creation of a new religion. In actuality, this is a tradition that even precedes Bainbridge. It has been the practice of Freemasonry for years. It was also the practice of Masonry's religious and philosophical progenitors, the ancient pagan mystery cults. The inner doctrines of the Mesopotamian secret societies provided the theological foundations for the Christian and Judaic heresies, Kabbalism and Gnosticism. All modern Luciferian philosophy finds scientific legitimacy in the Gnostic myth of Darwinism. As evolutionary thought was popularized, variants of Luciferianism were popularized along with it. A historical corollary of this popularization has been the rise of several cults and mass movements, exemplified by the various mystical sects and gurus of the 60s counterculture. The metastasis of Luciferian thinking continues to this very day. If we go back to the beginning, we will find out that there were two sources of truth. There was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and there was the tree of life in the garden. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil includes worldly knowledge of what is right and wrong. It's the letter of the law of God. And the dead religion based on compliance to the dead letter of the law. It's man-made compliance to law and man-made changes in outward behavior. It's a focus on self. If we focus on ourself, we can go two directions. We can indulge and become licentious, or we can go the other route, which is a problem in some churches. We can become self-righteous. It also includes a false trust that worldly philosophy and other fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil will expose Satan. It will not expose Satan. Why? Because Satan appears as an angel of light. Remember how much we have placed in the basket as it was passed around? Satan was willing to give Christ the entire world on the mountaintop. How's that for a donation? The fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil will not expose Satan. This is what is called in scripture the flesh. It leads to death, not to mention also producing in the mind lasciviousness, double-mindedness, and pride in what one knows. It's the goodness of man, and it's very popular. But the other tree in the garden, it included a fear of God, peace, God-centered knowledge, which is relevant to what God is doing, therefore wisdom. It's the spirit of the law. A living faith in a relationship with Yahweh God. Its spirit made changes in the heart. It focuses on Christ, the Spirit, and the Heavenly Father. It exposes Satan and his influences by correctly using the living Word of God written by the Spirit along with the guidance of the Spirit. It's what the Scriptures call the Spirit. It leads to life, not to mention a renewed sound mind and humility to learn from others and from the master teacher. It's the goodness of God. And it's very unpopular because a natural man doesn't receive the things of God because they're foolishness to him. 
In the mystery schools, they refer to this mystical time of coming out of the age of innocence as the Luciferian philosophy. I've tried to illuminate you with this for years on my radio broadcast. In the Bible, or in the church, they talk about the fall of man. Same thing. There's only one difference between the Luciferian philosophy and the fall of man is that those who talk about the fall of man believe in God whether or not they believe in a savior they believe in God the ones who believe in the Luciferian philosophy do not now here's how that works in the Bible we're told that Eve was tempted by Satan to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God had commanded Adam and Eve not to eat of the fruit of that tree. If you do, ye will surely die. Isn't that the commandment? Lucifer, through his agent Satan on the other hand, told Eve, God lied to you. He's holding back the fact that you too can become God. But first you have to eat of the fruit of this tree. And if you do, you will surely not die, but shall become as gods. Isn't that true? New World Order researcher William T. Still stated the following. Illuminism is really the religion of a benevolent, mythical Lucifer, not Satan. It is disguised as political idealism, bent on eradicating religion and monarchies in general, and Christianity in particular, and gaining global control for a commonwealth of nations, featuring universal democracy. To the secret societies, Lucifer is always depicted as a benevolent, peace-loving God with nothing but the best intentions for the human race. Among Luciferians, God is seen as evil, trying to keep knowledge away from man. The same scenario was repeated in the Garden of Eden, and the snake explained to Adam and Eve that God didn't want them to have knowledge that would make them wise. And when you study these secret societies, when you study guys like um, Albert Pike, and Pike is writing in, in Morals and Dogma about, he's using this ancient Gnostic name for God, the God of the Bible, Ialdabaoth. Okay? And he's referring to Ialdabaoth as being this lesser God who created Adam and Eve and the earth. Okay? And he goes on to say that it was devils that forbade Adam and Eve to eat from the tree of knowledge. But it was an angel of light, he says, who showed up and gave them permission to be redeemed through the tree of knowledge, the serpent. And you can see throughout Pike's writings in Morals and Dogma and his influence, another guy named Eliaphus Levi who taught, as Madam H. P. Blavatsky taught, this inversion of God and the devil, where God becomes the devil and the devil becomes God. Here's the way they look at it. Here's their metaphor for the end of innocence. Adam and Eve were held prisoner in the Garden of Eden by an unjust, cruel, and vindictive God. Until Lucifer, through his agent Satan, set man free from this garden by giving him the gift of intellect. Through the use of intellect, man will conquer the earth, will conquer nature, and will himself become God. It's taught in every Masonic temple in this land, every secret brotherhood, every secret society. Every mystical temple, every occult organization teaches the Luciferian philosophy. The Luciferian philosophy, Luciferianism, or even the belief and worship of Lucifer has been seen in some of the most influential people from the last few hundred years. While an assertion that the elite of the world are slaves of Lucifer may seem far-fetched, it is based on the actual writings of the elite themselves and even through observed rituals. 
One of the most famous cases of this was when filmmaker and broadcaster Alex Jones filmed from inside Bohemian Grove. The Grove is a retreat every year till this day for some of the most influential people in the United States and around the world, including heads of state and royalty. The elite, again, the so-called establishment kings, uh, those that know best, the visions of the anointed ones, are obsessed with the occult, from presidents to governors to the heads of industry. You see, for over a hundred and twenty plus years in Northern California, in Sonoma County, on a 2,700 acre secluded redwood grove, leaders from around the world, prime ministers, chancellors, presidents, governors, again, the heads of industry, banking, academia, the media, Hollywood, only a select few, a little over 2,000 people, travel there to engage in bizarre, ancient, Canaanite, Luciferian, Babylon, mystery religion ceremonies. in the Grove is by invitation only and is determined by such factors as social standing, occupation, and personal connections. Privacy is one of the Grove's most cherished virtues. Members may not photograph, record, speak, or write about activities at the retreat. While many public officials are Grove members, the press is a distinctly unwelcome guest. We're from ABC News. Well, get back there. Get back there. Can we talk to somebody in there? Get back there. To test this assertion, we will now look at many prominent and leading members of various factions of what many refer to as the New World Order. Albert Pike was a 33rd degree Mason, who was also known as the Plato of Freemasonry. One of the offices Albert Pike held within Freemasonry includes Sovereign Grand Commander of the Sovereign Council of Grand Sovereign Inspectors General of the 33rd degree. He was also believed to be the highest Mason in the United States in his day by many researchers. Probably the most honored Mason in American history. His name is General Albert Pike. And this guy is one of two Masons who has the honor of being buried in the house of the temple in Washington, D.C. You will have a lot of Masons try and tell you because if you read Albert Pike's material, you will find out that he's an antichrist, that he's a Luciferian, that he mocks Christianity, that he denies the virgin birth, that he denies the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he calls the early Christian fathers dunces. This is all in morals and dogma. The book which is virtually the Bible of the Scottish Rite. In his book, Morals and Dogma, he states the following in regard to Lucifer. Lucifer the light bearer, a strange and mysterious name to give the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning, is it he who bears the light? Doubt it not.
He later asserts the following in relation to Satan. For the initiates, this is not a person, but a force, created for good, by which we may serve for evil. It is the instrument of liberty or free will. They represent this force which presides over the physical generation under the mythologic and horned form of the god Pan. Thence came the he-goat of the Sabbat, brother of the ancient serpent, and the light-bearer, or phosphor, of which the poets have made the false Lucifer of the legend. Who this Lucifer was, the Lucifer of Freemasonry and the mystery religions, was revealed later by Pike in the following statement in the same volume. The Masonic religion should be, by all of us initiates of the high degree, maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. If Lucifer were not God, would Adonai, whose deeds prove his cruelty perfectly, hatred of man, barbarism, and repulsion of science, would Adonai and his priests culminate him? Yes, Lucifer is God, and unfortunately, Adonai is also God. For the eternal law is that there is no light without shade, no beauty without ugliness, no white without black, for the absolute can only exist as two gods, darkness being necessary for light, to serve as its foil, as the pedestal is necessary to the state. Thus, the doctrine of Satanism is a heresy, and the true and pure philosophical religion is the belief in Lucifer, the equal of Adonai. But Lucifer, God of light, God of good, is struggling for humanity against Adonai, the God of darkness and evil. Manly P. Hall is considered by most of the esoteric wisdom teachers and even people who have come out of that as being probably the leading occult philosopher throughout the 20th century. Masonic author and occult philosopher Manley P. Hall stated the following in his work, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry. When the Mason learns that the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands, and before he may step onward and upward, he must prove his ability to properly apply his energy. The ambitions of Lucifer have been recorded in scripture thousands of years ago in the book of Isaiah. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. So, in that one ambition, I will be like the Most High, Lucifer did away with monotheism, one true God, Introduced, he introduced polytheism. There will be many gods. Well, I'll be one of them. <laughs> In fact, he's going to be the supreme one. The Luciferian doctrine is not only confined to the Masonic Lodge. In fact, prominent Catholic theologians taught that man can become God. The Catechism of the Catholic Church quotes Catholic saints Athanasius and Thomas Aquinas as saying the following, For the Son of God became man, so that we might become God, the only begotten Son of God, wanting to make us sharers in his divinity, assumed our nature so that he made man might make men gods. The ultimate goal of the adversary of mankind, Lucifer, is to be like the Most High, to become God. This doctrine has been seen in some Christian televangelists such as Kenneth Copeland and Benny Hinn. Kenneth Copeland has been reported as saying, Man was created in the God class. We are in a class of gods. God himself spawned us from his innermost being. Christian researcher and author Dave Hunt commented in his book, A Cult Invasion, that Satanist leader Michael Aquinas stated with conviction on the Oprah Winfrey show, We are not servants of some god. We are our own gods. In at least partial agreement, Kenneth Copeland and Paul Crouch like Shirley MacLaine, insist on TBN that they are indeed gods. You are a little god, declare Copeland and Benny Hinn on TBN. I am a little god, exalts Paul Crouch on international television, and condemns to hell the heresy hunters who say this teaching isn't biblical. I am God. I am... Look, if I'm God, what does that make you? What we always see in others what we see in ourselves. I am God.
I am God. I am God. I am God. I am God. I am God. I am God. I am God. I am God. Donkey to save, you know. He appears, we're told that uh, in scripture in uh, 2 Corinthians 11, I believe, that he is an angel of light. So it's no wonder that his ministers masquerade as ministers of righteousness. This rebellion against God was even seen among the writings of Karl Marx. Even among the most unlikely sources, the influence of the adversary of mankind is felt. Believed to be an atheist, as present-day Marxists tend to be, but his writings suggest otherwise. This is highlighted in the book, Marx and Satan, by Reverend Richard Ormbrand. Marx wrote in one of his early poems, Then I will be able to walk triumphantly, like a god, through the ruins of their kingdom. Every word of mine is fire and action. My beast is equal to that of the creator. In another poem, called The Player, later downplayed by Marxists, he stated the following, The hellish vapors rise and fill the brain, till I go mad and my heart is utterly changed. See this sword? The Prince of Darkness sold it to me. For me he beats the time and gives the signs. Ever more boldly I play the dance of death. Then in his poem The Pale Maiden, Thus heaven I forfeit it. I know it full well, my soul once true to God is chosen for hell. And it is, you know, it's not just a matter of theological opinion, it is hatred against the God of the Bible and hatred against our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's entirely what they mean. Uh, I used to think that when the kings write out, because you go to Revelation 19 and you read, you know, it says, and I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse, Jesus. I used to think, well, you know, they're probably just out fighting and they don't realize they're fighting against Jesus. But the more I studied these secret societies and what they're doing, the more I'm convicted they know exactly what they're doing. Maybe not all, I can't say all Masons and all Rosicrucians, but many of these guys who are in positions of leadership, they know exactly what they're doing. A Nobel Prize winner has described the brain as, quote, a machine that a ghost can operate, unquote. What that means is, in an altered state of consciousness, the connection between my spirit that normally operates my brain and my brain is loosened, and that allows another spirit being to interpose itself, begin to tick off the neurons in the brain, create an entire universe of illusion, astral travel, give psychic powers. In this way, the world is being prepared for some ultimate delusion sheep to a slaughter most of most of us here and and we haven't we've failed to recognize the nature and the, the actual agenda of the new world order which is a spiritual agenda apparently even by the out of their own mouth it's a spiritual agenda that these beings are desiring the world, world order they're playing the people that just to get them to spread the message and that's mainly to get in touch with yourself that there's a higher self and um, that there's a certain pathway to getting there. Some people are into meditation, other people are into yoga, some people find uh, chiropractic important, other people find homeopathy important, and it's just really interesting to see how they're all interconnected. Why are you at the Mind, Body, Spirit Festival this evening? Well, I work with mind, body, and spirit in my work, so I like to uh, contribute and share and with other people who are interested in that kind of thing. In what ways do you work with the mind, body, and spirit? Uh, I do healing work, and um, I have a children's program up in Mount Shasta, hmm. uh, where it's a holistic program, so it's mind, body, spirit, work with uh, music and dance and uh, relaxation and healing, things like that. Why is a festival like this important? Because we need to have direction, you know, the ways we've been, the old ways longer fit with today's, what people want today, we can't do it the old way, we need new ways. The most exciting time, I think, in the whole history of mankind, when uh, we can either destroy ourselves or move into a new and wonderful golden age. We are raising an entire generation of children under the bombardment of cartoons and television shows and fantasy role-playing games and movies that are telling them that the occult and Eastern philosophy is a wonderful thing, not something to be afraid of, not something ugly and fearful, 
but something beautiful with the darling reptilian creatures with the great psychic powers that are drawing these children into an acceptance of things that are dangerous beyond anyone's comprehension. The reason we have all this stuff going on in Hollywood, look at the, most of the movies that are coming out at the moment. Look at the, mo the, the programs that are on TV. Stargate, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Dark Angel, look at all the movies, Avatar, uh, um, Taken. They're all occultic, they're all spiritual, they're all about vampires, they're all about werewolves, about contacting the get dead, about beings coming down to, to, from heaven to where, communicating ETs, extraterrestrials, aliens, all this stuff, the books, Twilight, what all these things are doing is, is they're conditioning and brainwashing the whole of the human race to prepare them. With the move away from traditional morals accelerating in Western society and the growth of skepticism towards monotheistic religions, it has not left a spiritual vacuum like some might believe. Due to the move away from absolutes, this generation has embraced postmodern thought. In this worldview, there is no right or wrong. There are no absolutes, as many have rejected God and the Bible. Postmodernism is a mood much more than it is a kind of an organized movement. Postmodernism was at the Garden of Eden when uh, Adam and Eve said, has God really said? What did postmodernism do? It questioned propositional truth. Does a statement really mean what it says or do you fuse your own meaning into any statement? So postmodernism questioned verbal authority that's where it all began. You don't leave the authority with the author, the authority goes to the reader. So you can read a book and you become sovereign over the author. That's what, exactly what happened at the Garden of Eden. They wanted to play as God. So postmodernism is actually quite pre-ancient. The thing is this, there was only one prohibition, only one. In the day that you eat of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, you shall surely die. And we were told not to eat of that because in the day we would eat of that, we would we would be as God knowing good and evil. What it really meant was we would redefine good and evil. You and I don't have the right to do that. The moment you and I redefine good and evil and we come up with two different definitions, whose good is going to trump the other person's good. That's exactly what has happened in our culture today. The person essentially embraces their own morality, creating their own rules, in a sense, becoming their own God. This has opened the door to occult practices being reintroduced to society and being repackaged in Western, scientific and even Christian terms. Techniques in the field of human medicine, today considered a science, especially in the field of psychology. Consider the following quote from Herbert Benson, MD, Harvard professor. The shaman can be viewed as an early psychotherapist. Highly influential Masonic author and occult philosopher Mali P. Hall stated the following. There is abundant evidence that in many forms of modern thought, especially in so-called prosperity psychology, willpower building, and the systems of high-pressure salesmanship, black magic has merely passed through a metamorphosis, and although its name may be changed, its nature remains the same. In 1931, the Occult Digest stated the following, There is a great awakening sweeping over the world today. There are times when one fully believes that we are entering a new and more complete age, into the sunlight of all knowledge made new. And um, the way it's been marketed is to make oneself better and everything inside of our, us as human beings, we want to be better people. We want to be, we strive for achievement, we strive for higher grades, we strive for, um, to do our best. And the same thing happens spiritually, but the way that spirituality is being packaged in America uh, is not being done in a religious way. So, for instance, in corporations or businesses, they are putting forward a spiritual concept to businessmen and corporate America by uh, inviting the um, hierarchy to go for better management courses. But actually, those better management courses are spiritual self-hypnosis and indoctrination into a whole Eastern worldview into a whole spiritual concept that is contrary to biblical traditional values. Another repackaged technique is that of yoga. In the past few decades, in the Western world, 
it has been seen as merely physical exercise. But that is not the case. The word means basically to yoke, union. The goal of the Hindu is to be yoked with Brahman. Brahman is the Hindu concept of God, the all or the absolute. Yoga is in many ways the heart of Hinduism. There is no Hinduism without yoga, and there is no yoga without Hinduism. Carol Matrishiana, who was born and raised in India, the homeland of Hinduism, Eastern mysticism, and guru worship, stated the following in her book, Gods of the New Age, on the importance of yoga to Hindu philosophy. Yoga, a practice synonymous with Hindu philosophy, means to yoke. Its goal is to unite man with Brahman, the Hindu concept of God, or rather, the consciousness called the God state. She discusses later in the book how the Western world has become entangled in Eastern mysticism, something that is commonly referred to as the New Age movement. The traditional purpose of the Indian ashram has always been to teach people how to die through yoga meditation. It has only been since the 1960s that the Beatles inspired young Westerners have flooded the ashrams, sitting spellbound at the Guru's feet. Today reincarnation, divination, yoga, tarot cards, many aspects of the occult, once thought of as being morally and spiritually dangerous, are now commonplace in Western society. This current day obsession with the occult has without doubt been fueled by the media and pop culture. This growth has been increasingly noticed by some researchers, leading some, such as Christian author Dave Hunt, to make the following comment in the 1980s. Today's world confronts a strange and growing paradox that could well make a pivotal point in human history. Even as the scientific and technological advancement which usher in the space age is accelerating at an exponential rate we are witnessing far and away the greatest occult explosion of all time. Former best-selling New Age author Randall N. Baer who turned from the occult after a horrific spiritual encounter he describes in his book Inside the New Age Nightmare about his experiences in the New Age or the occult and how he was set free from this bondage through faith in Jesus Christ. He stated in the late 1980s that the New Age movement needs to be understood as one of the fastest growing uprisings of the end times powerful delusion occurring in the world today. In fact, it has expanded with explosive diversification in the last three decades to a much greater extent than many realize. Today's rapid growth of the New Age phenomenon is nothing less than a major branch of the prophesied latter-day rise of the Antichrist forces. It is in this context that the most penetrating insights into the greatest deceptions and dangers of the movement are seen. As a teenager, Satan tempted me into dabbling in exotic Eastern mysticism and developing psychic powers, which hooked me into the New Age. This path led over the course of 15 years a life involving yoga, psychedelic drugs, holistic health, belief in reincarnation, acquiring familiar spirits, divination, crystal power, and many other New Age phenomena. In fact, through the years, I rose quickly through the ranks of the New Age to write two popular books by a respected mainstream publisher, which sparked a meteoric career ascent to national and international renown on the New Age scene. But in the midst of enjoying all this success, I had an absolutely horrifying encounter with evil forces, evil forces that masquerade as life and offer counterfeit truths through broad New Age paths. While I'll elaborate on this whole story later on in this talk, these demonic forces threatened to totally possess and devour me. And on the brink of seeming annihilation, I came to repent of many multitudes of sins and to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and personal Savior. One of the major themes I'd like to point out tonight is the rather alarming growth rate of this movement and how it has spread extensively throughout every level of our society in both obvious and well-disguised ways. The New Age movement has gone from being a hippie and eastern guru revival of the 1960s to being sparked in grassroots middle America in the 1970s to being one of the fastest rising phenomenon in our country in the 1980s. Findings of numerous highly respected researchers conclude that the New Age is the fastest growing alternative belief system in our country today. With the advent of what I call the Shirley MacLaine era starting in 1985 or so, 
the American general public has been exposed to at least a very general picture of the New Age agenda. As a society, we've become geared to basing our beliefs on our experiences. If our experience and our feelings tell us that something is valid and genuine and good, then we automatically assume that that is the measure of absolute truth. Far from being benevolent, as is often portrayed with many occult manifestations, it has been seen to be highly deceptive and without any solid foundation on which to test these experiences. Joanna Michelson in her book, The Beautiful Side of Evil, tells how society is embracing wholeheartedly the occult. Television talk show hosts are falling over one another to get the latest psychic wonder to appear for an interview. From Casper the Ghost to cartoons of space age marvels, children are being taught to accept supernatural phenomena as a wonderful part of their everyday life to be joyfully and fearlessly embraced. She also stated, Ouija boards are sold in almost every toy store, frequently next to Dungeons and Dragons, a game which is a cult to the core, whatever its devotees may believe. When my parents and I returned to the West in the 60s, uh, Hinduism had somehow been repackaged and was now being sung about by the Beatles. Um, there were West End shows in London, the hair, that were lifting up yoga, meditation, vegetarianism. Hare Krishna converts were going down the streets of Oxford Street in London singing about a Hinduism that I hadn't seen as a child growing up. Are there indeed spiritual forces guiding these changes in our society? Have we misunderstood the nature of the conspiracy? I think we would be very naive if we thought there wasn't a um, intentional purpose behind desensitizing uh, all of us into a worldview that is opposed to what our designer intended for us to think. Now it could be a deception on various levels. Uh, it's certainly intentional from a spiritual point of view because we know who the enemy of God is and that is Satan himself who wants very much for man to uh, stay away from the uh, power that has been given to man in his communication and fellowship with God and Satan wants to take that for himself he wants to be able to control and um, keep man in bondage so that he can possess him uh, physically on earth and eternally uh, in hell is it as many believe only a global police state or has its spiritual implications that overarch all of its outward, overt signs of change. And I would say that if I'm right, then we're all chasing the wrong thing. If I'm right, then the real new world order is winning and we are losing. Um, if I'm right, then we are all getting sucked into it and we, we don't really understand what they are wanting to do with getting everybody to believe that an evolution is coming. We haven't pieced that together. We've never even considered that what what and it, what that agenda could look like, or what, why would they would be pushing it? So. Uh, of this one world order and the new world religion, and that has been this idea has been around for six thousand years, ever since the Garden of Eden. What is so interesting in this whole incredible plan is coming to its culmination at the present time. When one day the earth wakes up, the world wakes up, and all these beings are going to appear again. V, we have it on the television. Five, you know. It, even the Vatican are telling us now that there are benign beings out there, but we're not to be afraid of them. They were created by the same God that created us. NASA is telling us they're trying to contact extraterrestrial beings. Everybody is at it. Most of the countries have opened up all their UFO uh, um, secret files and are revealing to the world, yes, we see all these UFOs. So between UFOs, uh, alien abductees, alien contacts, all the movies, TV programs and books that are prevalent today are all preparing subliminally. People don't even realize that, but they're being conditioned for the reappearance of these beings on earth in plain sight of a man once again, as it was, so shall it be. In Ephesians 6.12 we read, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. But if the conspiracy is spiritual in nature as the Bible states, where is it leading? Who is influencing the New Age movement of today? And what, if anything, is dangerous about this trend?
things that alarm me enough to actually drop seven years from my law practice and sound alarms on the New Age movement because I looked at it and I said, my God, this is the stuff of which Nazism was made. We can prove that Lester Crowley has been more influential on Western culture, popular culture, than any other human being. Now, that's quite incredible because he's also the most highly regarded Satanist. And a Satanist he was. Some uh, New Agers and some Satanists want to try to distance himself, distance Crowley from being a real Satanist. However, he makes it really clear. Uh, we have quote after quote after quote who he was serving and how he was serving his god Satan. In fact, he did rituals that make it quite clear. He would grab a frog in one of his rituals and he would uh, say, you know, hail unto the power of Satan. I have you, Jesus of Nazareth, to the frog. And then he would crucify this frog and speaking in the, in the terms as though he was Satan and treating this frog as though he was Jesus. This was just one of his many satanic rituals. He was a very, very evil man. He was kicked out of France and called the evilest man in the world or the wickedest man on earth by uh, the popular newspapers of his day. He talked about sacrificing several children to Satan. Uh, he, he talked about bringing in the New World Order under the coming Antichrist. So it's very pertinent to understand that many of these musicians that lined up after him were all about anarchy and rebellion against established uh, government and with the idea of bringing in a new world government. Uh... This is Edward Alexander Crowley, also known as Aleister Crowley. He styled himself the wickedest man in the world. He believed himself to be the great beast and he changed his name to Aleister Crowley so he it would add up in both English, Hebrew, and Greek Kabbalah as 666. In 1904, Crowley had a communication with an extraterrestrial being named Iwas. And this being, through his wife, <clears throat> kind of a channeling type operation, excuse me, brought forth a book that was called the Book of the Law in 1904. And this book declared that the slain and risen God, i.e. Jesus, had stepped off the throne and that a new God, the crowned and conquering child, was taking his place. And as a result of this, Crowley proclaimed the end of Christianity and the start of Crowleyanity. Obviously, the guy had no self-esteem problems. Uh, in fact, he was a brilliant genius. He could play eight chess games blindfolded. He was an accomplished poet, mountaineer, painter, writer. He had so many Masonic degrees that you could fill up five pages of a book with them. This guy was probably the most highly honored Mason in the world. And he was also the most dangerous man of the 20th century. And he began doing rituals to bring forth this crowned and conquering child. One of the most notorious figures of the 20th century is that of occultist Aleister Crowley, an incredibly complex figure who has been both defended and feared. As Crowley disciple Robert Anton Wilson commented, there is no sense in trying to whitewash Crowley's reputation. Aleister spent most of his life systematically blackening it. Aleister Crowley seemed to know from an early age that he was to serve his god, Satan. Before I touched my teens, I was already aware that I was the beast whose number is 666. I did not understand in the least what that implied. In my third year at Cambridge, I devoted myself consciously to the great work, understanding thereby the work of becoming a spiritual being, free from the constraints, accidents, and deceptions of material existence. As a child, while reading the book of Revelation, rather than identifying with the Lamb Jesus, he identified with the beast. The following account is written by Crowley in the third person. He liked to imagine himself in agony. In particular, he liked to identify himself with the beast, whose number is the number of a man, 603 score and 6. Also, he would write in confessions, echoing another theme from the Bible, man's original sin. My eyes were opened. I have become as a god, knowing good and evil. Probably the most significant book produced by Crowley was the Book of the Law, written in 1904. It was from this book that we get the popular saying of, Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, which became Do Your Own Thing of the 1960s. The book describes the establishment of Crowley's new eon. Crowley biographer Lawrence Sutton describes, in short, the old eon, of the dying God, 
of man preoccupied by his sins and morality must be avenged by the new aeon, in which humanity recognizes its own innate divine spirit. The transformation from the old aeon to new must be total. Fire, blood and blasphemy are prominent amongst the bird pangs. There will be ecstatic realizations for the worthy Thelemite. It is by the teachings of Horus that the readers of the book must expect to live and die. I mean, it's all about peace and love on the outside, but when it all comes down, there's going to be a brutal leader that will emerge, who Crowley uh, was forthright enough to talk about in his in his books and talk about this bloodbath that would come, when Christians would be put to death and. While Crowley taught a type of love, it would seem that this does not extend to Christians. Nature's way is to weed out the weak. This is the most merciful way too. At present, all the strong are being damaged and their progress hindered by the dead weight of the weak limbs and the missing limbs, the diseased limbs and the atrophied limbs, the Christians to the lions. A humanitarianism, which is the simplest of the mind, acts on the basis of the lie the king must die. The king is beyond death, it is merely a pool where he dips for refreshment. We must therefore go back to Spartan ideas of education. And the worst enemies of humanity are those who wish, under pretext of compassion, to continue its ills through the generations, the Christians to the lions. What is vital to consider is the significance of what occurred after Crowley's death and who followed his teachings, wholly or in part. Crowley did not, uh, had many followers. He uh, had followers through his magical organization, the OTO, which still exists today. He also had people who were very interested in him, who carried on his tradition. For example, Timothy Leary, who uh, people perceive as a guru, but he was also an illuminant of Thanateros, which is an offshoot of, uh, of Crowley's kind of uh, OTO and his magical practice. He copied a lot of Crowley's uh, behaviors and what Crowley did. He uh, attacked Christianity. He was a hedonist like Crowley. He visited the pyramid, Great Pyramid of Chaos and stayed in there much like Crowley did. He also traveled to Algeria where Crowley uh, emulated the magical practices or Enochian calls of uh, John Dee and Edward Kelly. Uh, he carried Crowley's toe, top tarot deck wherever he went. And he actually inverted, a, he made, wrote a book called Confessions of a Hope Fiend, which is an inversion of two of Crowley's books called Confessions and Diary of a Dope Fiend. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I've been an admirer of Aleister Crowley. I think that uh, I'm carrying on much of the work that uh, he started uh, over 100 years ago, and I think the 60s themselves. You know, Crowley said uh, um, he was in favor of, uh, of uh, finding your own self and, and uh, uh, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, under love. It was a very powerful statement. I'm sorry he isn't around now to appreciate the glories that he started. L. Ron Hubbard said he was following on his tradition. Uh, he actually started his religion or his new, you know, uh, new age ideal uh, church, the Church of Scientology on the day that Crowley died in 1947. The, these people have a great influence on the world. There was Jack Parsons, and he was the head of the Agape Lodge, which was the OTO Lodge out in California. And his, his scribe was actually L. Ron Hubbard. Charles Manson was a member of the Solar Lodge, which is an offshoot of the OTO. Uh, so Manson was very much knowledgeable in, or very knowledgeable about these kind of practices, and he had an immense influence upon the 60s. Alfred Kinsey visited uh, Aleister Crowley's Abbey of Thelema, which was his kind of uh, the inversion of a church that he had in uh, Chepelou, Sicily, and. Uh, the very dark rituals took place there. There were also musical followers, Jimmy Page, David Bowie, Ozzy Osbourne. Uh, there's his idea, Suffuse, uh, J.K. Rowling's uh, books uh, by Harry Potter. And uh, I haven't read all of her books, but her movies and what I've seen, the references to Flood and Sirius, these are all high, highly occultic uh, references that uh, indicate that she knows quite a bit more than 
she's uh, telling to the public. And, the, you know, these are books and movies that have been seen by billions of people. Ian Fleming was uh, influenced by Crowley. He wrote the James Bond uh, book. So it goes on and on. So they're still out here to get. There's a commonly understood uh, reference to Crowley and Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. I was going to mention that. Of course, Crowley appears on the cover uh, twice, didn't and, he? Uh, uh, I think I think I know just once, but there's also the kind of a uh, story about you know the intro to Sergeant Pepper says 20 years ago today, mm -hmm. Sergeant Pepper told the, taught the band to play, and uh, somebody told me that that was a reference to Crowley. Uh, it was 20 years ago today that to that day that Crowley passed away. So mm -hmm. uh, 6, 47 was when he died, and I guess the album came out in 67. So uh, and the, Lennon himself was a known occultist. He was. Uh, he would constantly go to occult bookstores in New York City and, you know, had some of his, his writings, Imagine, and, you know, all these other uh, uh, songs and stuff reference a lot of uh, cult subjects. So, Occult doctrines have led to the 1960s counterculture and led countless people down a path that has seen devastating results. Probably the greatest example of this was the rise of Nazi Germany in the 1930s. During this time, before the rise of Hitler's Nazi party, Germany experienced an enormous rise in occult interest. Well, this allowed the Fuhrer to spellbound his audiences. The current worldwide revival of Hinduism blended with psychology and disguised as self-improvement, self-hypnosis, positive mental attitude seminars, visualization techniques, and mind dynamics courses has made today's world far more susceptible to spiritual deception than the Germany that embraced Adolf Hitler. French intellectual Dennis de Rogmond attended a Nazi rally during 1938. De Rogmond indicated that, despite his rigorous attempt to remain detached from the spectacle unfolding before him, he was involuntarily drawn into the vortex of the crowd's hysterical adulation of Adolf Hitler. It was only by dint of a kind of superhuman resolve, said the French philosopher, that he was able to regain his equilibrium before the mesmerizing presence of Hitler's evil genius. The Rogmond is believed to have stated the following. Some people believe, from having experienced in his presence a feeling of horror and an impression of supernatural power, that he is a seat of thrones, dominions and powers, by which St. Paul meant those hierarchical spirits which can descend into any ordinary mortal and occupy him like a garrison. What I am saying would be the cheapest form of romantic nonsense, were it not for what has been established by this man, or rather, through him, is a reality that is one of the wonders of the century. Eventually I found a book called Running God's Plan by Foster Bailey. And he said one of the goals of their hierarchy was to have a unified Europe. He said, we tried this before, working through a disciple, using the Rhine River Valley and the inhabitants of that valley as a binding factor. That attempt was unsuccessful, but now another attempt is in full swing, namely the Six Nation European Common Market. And you don't need to have been an, even an A student in history to have known who that disciple was, Adolf Hitler. Hitler was greatly influenced by the writings of a 19th century occultist, Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. He was reported to have slept with a copy of her book, the Secret Doctrine by his bedside. 
Blavatsky founded the Theosophical Society with Henry Alcott in 1875. The swastika itself was taken from the logo of the Theosophical Society. Even this connection was noticed by the History Channel in a recent documentary. One of the occult doctrines that would foreshadow Nazism was spelled out for the whole world in an unlikely place by an unlikely writer. Living in London is a Russian aristocrat turned best-selling author named Madame Helena Blavatsky. In more than a thousand pages, Blavatsky rewrites the history of the world from the creation to the present. Her story is based on unconventional sources, Babylonian astrology, Egyptian hieroglyphics, and a mishmash of the occult. So if Blavatsky had such a profound influence, what did she believe? Blavatsky stated the following in her work, The Secret Doctrine, Volume 1. The devil is now called darkness by the church, whereas in the Bible he is called the Son of God, see Job, the bright star of the early morning, Lucifer, see Isaiah. There is a whole philosophy of dogmatic craft and the reason why the first archangel who sprang from the depths of chaos was called Lux, Lucifer, the luminous son of the morning, or Manvan Tariq Dawn. He was transformed by the church into Lucifer or Satan because he is higher and older than Jehovah and had to be sacrificed to the new dogma. Echoing the same Luciferian beliefs of the elite, she continues later in the secret doctrine. In this case, it is but natural, even from the dead letter standpoint, to view Satan, the serpent of Genesis, as the real creator and benefactor, the father of spiritual mankind. For it is he who was the harbinger of light, bright radiant Lucifer, who opened the eyes of the Adamaton, created by Jehovah, as alleged, and he who was the first to whisper, In the day ye eat thereof, ye shall be as Elohim, knowing good and evil, can only be regarded in the light of a savior. So if Blavatsky influenced Hitler and the Nazi movement, as many researchers now believe, and she is also often referred to as the mother of the New Age, has the New Age and Nazism any similarities? You've written several articles about the New Age movement. She said, yes, I have. I said, how would you like to see the flip side of that movement? I said, she said, what do you mean? I said, I've examined it carefully. It's identical to Nazism. The following is taken from Constant Combe's book, The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow. From pages 114 to 120, she details many similarities between the Nazi movement and the New Age. They include some of the following, quote, Nazism taught the doctrine of Arianism and Arian purity that the New Age would feature an Arian mutant master race. The New Age movement teaching stressed the doctrine of Arianism and Arian purity. See especially Alice A. Bailey's writings and the writings of David Spangler. Nazism featured hatred of Jews and an ancient occult doctrine of a blood taint resting on the Jews and that there was a need for a final correct solution to this Jewish problem. The secret doctrine of occultism features hatred of the Jews. The writings of Alice Bailey, which have been followed meticulously by the New Age movement, state that the new Messiah will not be Jewish as the Jews have forfeited their privilege and that they must pass through the fires of purification in order to learn humility. These teachings are also strongly opposed to Zionism and the possession of a homeland by the Jewish people. These teachings also state that what happened to the Jewish people in World War II was a result of their bad national karma. Nazism featured the quest for the Holy Grail as a path to transcendental or higher consciousness. The New Age movement features the quest for the Holy Grail as a path to transcendental or higher consciousness. Hitler used mescaline to speed up consciousness expansion. The use of drugs as a catalyst in consciousness expansion has long been a part of the New Age movement. The Nazis thought that they had evolved into a new and superior species by means of spiritual disciples and consciousness evolution. The New Agers think they have evolved into a new and superior species, Homo Noeticus as opposed to Homo sapiens by means of spiritual disciples and consciousness evolution. Hitler was an initiate of occult practices, including yoga, Tibetanism, hypnosis, and the secret doctrine of Elena Petrovna Blavatsky and the Tibetan masters. Benjamin Krem says that the Maitreya the Christ is a seventh degree initiate 
Entrance into the New Age requires a Luciferic initiation. The Nazis believed in the law of karma and reincarnation. The New Agers also believe in the law of karma and reincarnation. Nazism sought the institution of a new world order in which the Aryan race would predominate and control. The New Age movement seeks the institution of a new world order in which Aryanism will prevail. Nazis believe the roots of their Aryanism were first found in Atlantis. The New Agers trace their secret doctrine and occult teachings to Atlantis. Constance Cumbie states the following in relation to the New Age belief in Atlantis that shrouded in the mists of Atlantis which may well refer to the pre-noetic era are the roots of both New Age doctrine and Nazism. A portion of this doctrine deals with the origins of the races of mankind. The secret doctrine held that they originated in Atlantis and that one of the seven Atlantean races was that of the Aryans. Although there were supposedly six other Atlantean races, the Aryans were the master race or supermen of the Atlantean races. Many of these New Age doctrines have clearly been circulated and propagated among the general population, especially among what is currently called today the Truth Movement. What is interesting to know it also is that the Bible thousands of years ago predicted a time when people would go after doctrines of demons and seducing spirits. In 1 Timothy he states the following, Now the spirits speak it expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. In 2 Peter chapter 2 we read, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 to 5 we read, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they were willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old. But this is exactly how the Bible predicted the end times would be before the time of Jesus' return, a time when the word of God is not taken seriously, a time when scoffers and skeptics of the Bible are taken more seriously than people who know what the Bible actually says. Many Christians believe that it is a book to be taken as absolute truth. Before we continue in our study of the New World Order, we need to see what the Bible says on this issue. Because if it is what it says it is, of the absolute truth, it must be taken and first consulted above all other books, above all other references. But why trust the Bible? What makes the Bible different to any other book on earth? How can we prove that the Word of God is exactly as it says it is? No ancient document, none, has the kind of documentary support that the Bible has. You and I don't have to defend this book. We don't have to defend a lion. If you open the cage, the lion will defend itself. What we talk about here is strengthening our own belief and faith in the words of God, knowing that our faith is built on facts. I just want to look at evidence. What sets the Bible apart from any other religious texts, say the, the Quran or the Ramayana or whatever else? What sets it apart? The one thing that sets the Bible, the Word of God, apart from any other book, be it the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita or, or you know, uh, uh, James Joyce's Ulysses or anything else, is, is that about a third or more of the Bible is prophetic. That's what set it, setting it apart. It's telling you things that are going to happen before they do. So the veracity of the Bible or the non-veracity or the truthfulness is borne out by the fulfillment of those prophecies. The following passage describes how God will declare the future before it happens, so that when it happens, it is clear that this is his word and he is the true God. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 46, we read, 
Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from the ancient times the things which are not yet done. Yea, I have spoken it, and I will also bring it to pass. I have proposed it, I will also do it. We believe that the scriptures are the inspired word of God. We believe that the words that are in the Bible are not just John's words. They're not just Peter's. They're not just Paul's or Matthew or Isaiah or Moses. They are the words of God. They came from the mind, from the heart, from the foreknowledge of God. The book of Daniel is written in the late 500s before Christ. And yet when you study the book of Daniel, you begin to see the specifics of a fantastic prophecy. He talks about a massive empire that will come into being and how that, that empire will be, will be divided into four and that empire will be led by what they call a strident, strong he-goat from the west who will be marching several nations underfoot but shall be suddenly cut off and his empire will be divided into four. Those four then emerge into two and those two blend into one. When you take the book of Daniel written late 500s and put it pro forma onto Alexander the Great in the 300s before Christ, you see the stridency of Alexander suddenly cut off in his 20s. Four kingdoms emerge given to his four generals. Those four come into the two, the Ptolemaic and the Seleucid empires. That emerged then into the Roman Empire. Centuries before to be so specific in prophecy. The book of Daniel written 537 BC shows the supernatural origin of the Bible. Dr. Chuck Missler stated the following. What makes the book of Daniel particularly striking is that it also portrays in advance the subsequent Greek and Roman empires and even highlights the career of Alexander and the four generals that succeed him after his death. The book of Daniel traces the course of world powers from his own day to the second coming of Christ. The book of Daniel describes future empires and in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. But this is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. And after thee shall arise another kingdom, inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. The book of Daniel describes the four major world empires. First we have Babylon, the head of gold. Then we have the arms of silver, which is the Medo-Persian Empire. We have the belly and thighs of brass, which is Greece. And then we have the two legs of iron of Rome. Many scholars believe the representation of the iron and the part of clay at the feet of the image represents the re-emergence of the Roman Empire, while others believe that it is a world empire of ten regions. But what is clear is the Bible predicts a world government through this book and also the book of Revelation showing how there would be a new world order upon the earth, a new world order that would destroy. But first, would promise peace. Further details of these empires are given in Daniel chapter 7 and chapter 8. These testify of the amazing specificity of the book of Daniel and how centuries before these empires came on the earth the Bible predicted them. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel after which appeared unto me at the first. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass. Then I lifted up mine eyes, and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram, which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward, and northward, and southward, so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. But he did according to his will, and became great. And as I was considering, behold, a 
he goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes and he came to the ram that had two horns which I had seen standing before the river and ran unto him in the fury of his power and I saw him come close unto the ram and he was moved with collar against him and smote the ram and brake his two horns and there was no power in the ram to stand before him but he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand therefore the he goat waxed very great and when he was strong the great horn was broken and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven and out of one of them came forth a little horn which waxed exceedingly great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. Here we see the amazing prophecy centuries before it occurred of the fall of the Medo-Persian Empire to Alexander the Great. Daniel 8 ta is, a, is a detail now on the, the, the Persians and the Greeks. And the, uh, the ram is defeated by the goat, the rapid goat coming from the west. It's clearly, it's, 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 it's a very vivid description of Alexander's conquest of the Persians. And uh, this notable horn namely Alexander himself, uh, is killed and, he, and uh, four generals divide up the empire. And there's a little horn that has a key role at the end, that's going to be important later. And da Daniel interprets this for us, a leader from the west, obviously Alexander the Great, will subdue the Medo-Persian Empire. The one horned goat was the symbol of the ancient Macedonians, uh, in, uh, in uh, Ares the ram is the symbol of Persia, Capricorn the, uh, the goat uh, symbol of Greece, and in May 30, 334, he crossed the Hellespont with 35,000 troops and first met, defeated the Persians at the Granicus River. And then the, a year later, he finds himself uh, uh, at the Battle of Isis and uh, wins that one. And uh, the, the final big one was Gagamela, October 331 BC, which establishes the Greek Empire as the dominant guys of the block here. When Alexander dies shortly thereafter, he makes Babylon his capital, he finally dies. He goes all, he, by the way, he conquers all the way to India. And uh, Cassander takes the western part, the four generals divide it up. Lysimachus uh, takes uh, Thrace, Bithynia, and most of Asia Minor, Asia Minor being what we think of as Turkey. Um, Ptolemy uh, takes the south, Egypt, Cyrene, and part of, of, of Arabia. And Seleucus takes the east, Syria and lands to the east, all the way to India, but much of that's hard to hang on to. The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia, and the rough goat is the king of Grecia, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation. And uh, this notable horn, namely da Alexander himself, uh, is killed and, and uh, four generals divide up the empire. In Revelation 19.10 it attests to the fact that for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The fact that prophecy is true, the fact that 30% of the Bible is prophetic, the fact that the Bible predicts events before they occur shows that the Bible is true. Well, there are many, many prophecies that attest to the fact that the Bible is truly God's Word and proves it beyond a shadow of a doubt. None should be more evident to the world than the return of Israel to its land in 1948. Many, many, many prophecies in the Old Testament that said that the Jews, the children of Israel, would be kicked out of Palestine, they would be scattered all over the whole face of the world, and that everywhere they would go they would be despised and persecuted and hated of all nations. Well, in 70 AD, a Roman general called Titus went in to put down an insurrection in Jerusalem. He slaughtered about a million Jews. The rest were scattered all over the whole face of the world, hence the wandering Jew. And everywhere these people went, they were despised and persecuted and hated. And that culminated in the Holocaust in Germany in the Second World War, when millions of them were murdered. But there's many, many other prophecies that say, in the last days, in the last generation that God would regather his chosen people, Israel, and establish them in Palestine again. And he would do this as a sign to the rest of the world that we were in the last days. And like even back as I think it was like, you know, if you look at old accounts before 1948, the thoughts of the Jews returning to the homeland were seen as ridiculous at that time.
2,000 years, almost. You've got these people coming from all over the world into Israel in 1948. Now, before, 48 was when they became a homeland, but prior to that, they were all there from, from the end of the war, from 45 on. You know, they were there, and um, we all know what happens. You know, they, the British pull out, and, you know, a nation becomes a nation in a day. It's kind of bizarre after 2,000 years. And in fact, in one uh, prophecy, I think it's in Jeremiah, it said that they would become a nation in one day. And that literally happened because back in May of 1948, uh, the, the, the British went into the UN with a proposal that uh, the Jews be given their own nation state. It was seconded by the United States of America and literally in one day, Israel became a nation again and they were given back their old homeland of Palestine and they went back in. Now, irrespective of the rights and wrongs of what's happened with the Jews and the Palestinians and Arabs that time, the point is, is that prophecy has been fulfilled. In 1948, after almost 2,000 years of a worldwide scattering, the Jews are back in Israel. Now, I have a book in there written by a fantastic scholar called E.W. Bullinger, or Bullinger, and he lived about 100 years ago, and he wrote in his book that when we see the Jews returning to Israel again, returning to Palestine again, we will know that we're in the last generation. And he wrote that some 40 years before they came back. This man was, because he knew his Bible. If you believe in, in the prophetic time clock, and I do, I believe that, that the only way you can look, we as Christians can, can factor anything in at all, is you gotta look at Israel. Israel's the key. Israel is the key. The prophecies hinge around Israel. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. These prophecies are even more remarkable when one realizes that the population of Jerusalem was only about 9,000 in the early 1800s and about 60,000 in 1905. Well, a cup of trembling. I mean, what a stupid remark. I mean, that, you know, what, what's that about? I mean, it's, what, a, what a ridiculous statement to make. You know, and scoffers at the Bible have pointed to that and go, please, Jerusalem, a cup of trembling in the whole world? Let's take it literally. Let's look at that 500 years ago. Let's look at it during the Crusades a thousand years ago. Not to the whole world, it wasn't a cup of trembling, was it? Not to the whole world, in a, in a literal sense. And I'm, I'm a literalist, unfortunately. But when it says the whole world, Jerusalem today is a cup of trembling to the whole world. In Israel, there's six and a half million of them there. World peace is contingent upon what happens in that little narrow neck of the woods. It's only the same size as Munster. You know, about a quarter the size of Rhode Island. And so, when we switch on the news at night and we see trouble in Israel between the Palestinians and the Jews, or the Iranians, or the Lebanese and the Jews, we are watching that prophecy coming to pass. The United Nations has condemned Israel more than 370 times. They never condemned the Arabs for attacking them. They condemned the Jews for defending themselves. I mean, it's incredible. <laughs> The whole world is against them. Uh, and God said, I'll make them a cup of trembling. And this is the number one problem that the United Nations faces today. Everybody knows it. The United Nations has spent one third of its time in deliberations and pronouncements about Jerusalem and Israel. This little land that has one one thousandth of the world's population. They spent a third of their time on it. Yet today, world peace rests on the shoulders of this tiny region. The 66 books we call the Bible are actually penned by over 40 people over almost 2,000 years that are an integrated message, and that's a technical term. Uh, it's not just that there's a theme in the Old Testament, fulfill the new, more than that. We now discover that every detail, every number, every place name appears to be in there by design. Mm -hmm. And you have to discover that for yourself, but once you do, uh, it changes your whole perspective. I've had to, obviously, over a 60-year Christian career, I've had to revise my perception of various passages many times through the years, but it's always been in the direction of taking it even more seriously than I did before. 
Bible commentator John R. Rice made the following comment. I am convinced that the only people who do not believe the Bible are those who have not studied it devoutly and tried it thoroughly, and do not know the evidence in its favor, or who have a deliberate and wicked bias against God and the truth. Jesus said, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Then he said, You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. He claimed that he's the Son of God. That's clear from history. He made that assertion. Now, anybody can claim that. But why is it that people around the planet have believed Jesus? The question is, do you have any evidence to back up your claim? And what we have is the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He didn't just say I'm the Son of God, but we have convincing evidence. We have uh, evidence, you know, I thought the five E's real quick to summarize the evidence of the resurrection. The execution of Jesus. He was clearly dead when he was taken off the cross. I mean, even the Journal of the American Medical Association did an article analyzing the historical medical data and said clearly he was dead even before the spear was thrust into his side. Secondly, we have the empty tomb. Everybody in the ancient world agreed the tomb of Jesus was empty on that first Easter morning. The question was, how did it get empty? And of course, the religious authorities made up the story that the disciples had somehow stolen the body. Well, they didn't have the means or the motive or the opportunity. So that clearly isn't the answer, but the, the tomb was clearly empty. Third, we have eyewitnesses, over 515 eyewitnesses, including skeptics, whose lives were transformed because they encountered the resurrected Jesus in a lot of different circumstances. They touched him, they ate with him, they communicated with him. This is not a legend, not a hallucination, not wishful thinking. This was reality. This creed says Jesus died. Why? For our sins. He was buried. He was resurrected on the third day. And then it mentions the names of specific eyewitnesses, including skeptics, who encountered him and were willing to die for their conviction that he returned from the dead and proved he's the son of God. Now this creed has been dated back by scholars from a wide range of theological belief to as early as 24 to 36 months after the life of Jesus and the beliefs that make up that creed go right back to the cross itself. So this is like a newsflash from ancient history. This is reliable historical data. Within the life of Jesus, he fulfilled over 300 prophecies from the Old Testament. Many of these prophecies were written centuries before the coming of the Messiah. Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner. And I read that and I said, oh my goodness, he's coming back the same way as he went. I never knew this. I never heard this before and yet I'm supposed to be a Christian. Then I looked and it referred me up to Thessalonians 4, where it talks about what happens when Jesus Christ comes back. And it said, The Lord himself descends from heaven with a shout, with the trump of God and the voice of the archangel. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are al alive and remain, when he comes back, shall be caught up together to meet him in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And when I read that, I almost went through the roof, Paul. I thought, you know, I was ready to, to shoot up. And I believe that God showed me that night, and that was 1976, that God showed me that night that I was going to be alive when Jesus Christ comes back. And I am as, as convinced of that today, 34 years later, than I was the night it happened to me. And that's why I've written my four books, all which teach people about the second coming of Jesus Christ and lead people by giving them enough evidence to believe in the, in the Word of God, in the prophecy, how prophecy comes to pass and give people an opportunity to be saved. Because when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved, you're redeemed. If you're redeemed, it's like, you know, if you put something into a pawn shop and you get 20 euros for it and they give you a ticket and then you go back a month later and you give them 20 euros, you can redeem that thing out of the pawn shop. Jesus Christ redeemed us, he bought us back, he paid for us with his blood and with his death and his sacrifice and God raised him from the dead and because of that we are saved from the wrath to come three different times we're told in the epistles in Romans 5 and in Thessalonians that we're, we are saved from the coming wrath Thessalonians 1 10 it says we're to wait with patience from his son who has rescued us from the coming wrath so please don't tell me that we are not saved through the coming wrath when the word of God says we are 
We are saved from the wrath to come, and I want to save as many people as possible before the horrible, uh, excruciating, woeful events of the apocalypse befall this earth, and I don't think it's too far away. Why do the heathen rage, and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, and against his anointing, saying, Let us break their bands asunder, and cast away their cords from us. But see, the thing is, that's what the Bible said 2,000 years ago. It laid out their plan, and, it, and, and that's why they have to continually discredit it. Just be thinking that, about that logically with me. If these people have an agenda to create a one world government and a one world religion, and the Bible went and told, told on them 2,000 years ago, which validates the rest of it, of course they're going to have a massive campaign to discredit, discredit that. Oh, don't look at that. That's just crazy. Don't, you wouldn't want anything to do with that. That's, that you would, don't, just don't look at that. That's not, it's not for you. you should, that's stupid. That's a propaganda. For there to control your mind. Don't you, don't you know? I believe there's a strict, uh, clear uh, agenda. If you read into the old lines of uh, um, Helena or Alice Bailey or David Spangler, uh, Paul von Ward, all these other guys, Benjamin Krim, so forth, and some of the older Luciferians, their, their, their agenda is very clear. They know that there's going to be a great cleansing uh, in order to bring about a whole new age, a whole new spiritual age. It's about a spiritual evolution. And it's a time in which the, the powers of the universe are going to enlighten mankind whether they're ready or not. Uh, but you mean an external influence? It's something. It's something. I'm absol I absolutely, at a deep level, I know it. While many today in the truth movement believe that the momentum is fighting against the new world order and even winning, they are in fact being led by such people as Michael Tessarian, Jordan Maxwell and David Icke who they themselves are adherents to New Age doctrines. But while these men expose some truth in regard to political corruption, they steer in the direction of the real or spiritual New World Order. The most striking example of this is the influence of Blavatsky on Michael Tessorian and Jordan Maxwell. You, yes. Gentlemen, have you ever heard or read uh, Mrs. Blavatsky? She's uh, uh, Alina Petrovna Berlatsky. Right. Yes. Right. Yes, I have all of her works. You have? Yes. Well, that's why. Yes. I no, think her, her, her best work was Isis Unveiled, Part 2, which is uh, Theology. Right. Science. And uh, that was an exceptional uh, work. I think that Helena Petrovna Bovlatsky, the Russian mystic, was a very wise and perceptive lady, and she had some very profound uh, knowledge, uh, obviously, and her academic uh, uh, achievements were, were extraordinary, and so I have a very high respect for the work of Helena Blavatsky. Now, Madame Blavatsky, one of the greatest uh, scholars the world has ever known, writes in this way. She says the appellation Satan in Hebrew belongs by right to the first and cruelest adversary of all other gods, Jehovah, not in the serpent which spoke only words of sympathy and wisdom. In this quote, it's clear that Sarin agrees with Blavatsky, the greatest scholar the world has ever known, that what we call God should be called Satan, and the serpent is actually our good friend. I just want to show you how by any definition, Tessarian is a Luciferian, regardless of what he tells you that minute that the serpent represents. We're being brought into a new world that you are not going to recognize in the next 20 to 50 years. And one great example of the way this works I came across, which the, the, the beings, which we, we call the guys, uh, told us about. You call them the guys? The, gu the guys, yeah. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's not... Um, it's like, not like the beings like... Uh, uh, Ataro, Rakowski. Rakowski. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. Now, he uh, was Jesus' father, Rakowski. That's and, right. And Merlin as well. Part of him was, yeah. yeah. That's right. Uh, the aspects. Now, although there's a lot to talk about from that clip, the thing that I want to focus in on is the being's name. Rakorsky. In Theosophy, Rakorsky is one of the Ascended Masters. These are the beings that are supposedly so evolved that they have transcended the physical realm and now they are helping humanity pass through a coming age of enlightenment. 
Rakorsky was a particular Ascended Master that Alice Bailey wrote extensively about. It is especially significant that Ike calls him the Lord of all creation, and elsewhere, as we will see, the Lord of civilization, and says that he is, quote, directly responsible for the changes the earth will undergo, because these are absolutely clear examples that he is referring to the same Ascended Master that Alice Bailey made prominent, as she gave him those exact titles and said that his task was to establish the new civilization of the age of Aquarius. So when you hear Christians talking about the last days and the end of the world and the end times, we're talking about the end of the age of Pisces. We're talking about, yes, the end times, the end of the age of Pisces and the coming age of the man with the water pitcher. Now, when the end of the age of Pisces is coming, and we will be going into the new age of Aquarius. Oh, but that's devil worship. That's evil. That's astrology. No, that's the Bible. And uh, mankind is on the brink of it. The ascended masters are all saying the same thing, whether they're Tibetan, whether they're uh, the ones that uh, Helena you know, was involved with, or whether current ones. Um, Paul von Ward, in his book, God's Genes and Consciousness, he now you know, acknowledges a presence over him and communicating systematically of the advanced being. He calls them advanced beings. Uh, some of the older books refer to the Great White Brotherhood, but they're communicating the exact same message. The, the overwhelming fear that grips the child, that's the kind of fear I felt. They began to move over our heads and began to change places as if they were doing some sort of a little routine to show us what they could do and they radiate and, I'm, and that's something you need to remember they radiated a fear off of them uh, you could feel it you're in the presence of something awesome fearful and I grew up from about the age of seven or eight having other world experiences all of my life I have been involved in other world experiences um, for whatever reason and I said to them I said look at I know you're here okay and I want you to know that I don't mind doing whatever it is I'm supposed to do if I've got a destiny in life or a mission or whatever it is uh, I don't mind doing it but if it has something to do with you then I'm going to ask you for two favors do not abduct me because I don't want to go anywhere and don't frighten me in my bedroom I don't want to wake up and find something in my bedroom I can't handle, okay? So don't mess with me, and don't scare me to death, and I don't want to go anywhere. But if I'm supposed to do something, if there's a divine plan of some sort where I'm supposed to play, then open the door, show me what I am to do, and leave me alone. That people like you have now come to decide that I am working for the Illuminati. You're a true believer, Jordan. I've always thought that. You think that what you're doing is good, but it, it's just something that you can obviously tell that those angels weren't good, the message isn't good. You are being used to, to spread the one message that the New World Order does really care about, and that is turn away from Jesus Christ at all costs. Jordan Maxwell has stated that he has been influenced not only by Blavatsky, but also by Manny Palmer Hall, the 33rd degree Freemason. I'd like to pay tribute to three people who have influenced my life greatly. The, probably the most impressive man I have ever personally known and has uh, impacted my life was Mr. Manley Palmer Hall. Manley P. Hall, if you do not know, is one of the most brilliant spiritual men that I have ever even read about. And so I want to pay tribute to Mr. Hall. They're showing from their primary documents what they are trying to do. And here in this document, Manley Palmer Hall tells us that a secret governing body controls the globe, not the various religious governing bodies that pretend to rule. That's what I was trying to tell you with that diagram with the black uh, circle in the middle of the pie. And who is Manley P. Hall? Manley P. Hall was a Grand Master in the Illuminati and he was also a Grand Master in Freemasonry and here is the Scottish Rite Journal journal's obituary of him illustrious Manley Palmer Hall often called Masonry's greatest philosopher they were to deny that Lucifer was their God whenever an outsider was smart enough to break through all of the secrets and figure it out 
Well, of course, folks, they're sworn to secrecy. They have to deny anything about the true secrets of their order. I mean, what kind of logic is this? That's plain as the nose in your face. You must understand that when you ask a Mason a question about Freemasonry, he's going to tell you a lie because he is sworn to secrecy, and he is sworn by blood oaths. And I know that by the time they've reached the 32nd degree, they've taken at least 32 different oaths swearing them to secrecy. Manly P. Hall, if you do not know, is one of the most brilliant spiritual men that I have ever even read about. And so I want to pay tribute to Mr. Hall. And who is Manly P. Hall? Manly P. Hall was a grandmaster in the Illuminati. What is even more disturbing is when one considers the following quote from Manny Palmer Hall's book, America's Assignment with Destiny. Genuine esoteric associations always required that disciples prepare themselves for careers of practical service. The student was expected to attain to a state of unusual skill or proficiency in some branch of learning. He was then to practice this profession or craft as a means of extending his sphere of constructive influence. He was to teach through example, enriching his chosen vocation with the overtones of enlightened religious philosophy, thus gradually creating a significant zone of influence. He was available for whatever task the keepers of the great plan required. Practical ends can only be achieved by practical means, and the agents of the universal reformation must be sufficient for every emergency. And I believe that they are picking individual people today according to their own design, according to their own agenda. And they are picking individuals today to help enlighten the whole human family. Then came the third stage, which started in 2003, when I had an ayahuasca experience in um, Brazil, and a voice talked to me for five hours about the nature of reality. Real clear, very funny, and uh, mind-blowing and uh, life-changing. I have often wondered if Ike has ever taken any precautions to make sure that the entities that he is in contact with are good entities. He often talks about how the Illuminati are in contact with bad extra-dimensional beings, after all. And the same gods, demonic entities as they're called in this case, that are worshipped by the Satanists, are the same gods that are worshipped by the secret societies and the religions. Unknowingly, in Satanism, it's knowingly. These reptilian entities seem to operate, and again, it's not just reptilian. There are, there are many different kinds of entities that do not have a human form that operate just outside of human sight, and history has recorded them as demons and all this stuff. So I wonder if he had a system to discern whether the ones that he's talking to are the same ones that are influencing the Illuminati. You can imagine I was a bit discouraged to hear things like this. Well, I've been on a, a, a long journey of nearly 20 years now, consciously doing this, and some force has been um, pushing me in different directions through intuition, through urges. I've just got to do this. I've just got to go there. As I've gone through this and followed it, um, and who the force is and they are, I don't know. I, I, I'm not really that interested, funnily enough, because I just go with it and I'll remember what it's all about when I leave this genetic space suit. Now here is the mystery considering all that we have learned so far. I think, I think, I think there's a lot of this uh, whole new age area, you know, of, um, of ascended masters and all the Blavatsky stuff and uh, Ashtar Command. I say that they are, that is a belief system controlled by the same force, which is also trawling that bloody energy as we go along. Again, considering everything we have just learned, this is clearly an admission that he has been lied to by the spirits all of his life. I mean, if they told him that they were Alice Bailey's ascended masters, which they did, and they taught him theosophy word for word, which they did, he must be admitting here that all that he was taught is a lie. But the problem is, is that he has never stopped teaching and promoting the beings he talked to or what they told him to teach. He clearly attributes everything he is to them. Among these messages that was given to me in 1990 
were, uh, he will say things and wonder where they came from. They will be our words. Sometimes we will put knowledge into his mind. Sometimes he will be led to knowledge. Another one was, a little bit later, um, arduous seeking is not necessary. Ike never has mentioned the name Alice Bailey in his early books, although in them it's clear that he's teaching her doctrine, things like about the seven rays and the coming evolution, the solar logos, the new age, Atlantis, Lemuria, the age of Aquarius, being destroyed because of bad evolution, the earth spirit, the moon problem, her particular brand of reincarnation, even wearing certain colors. He never once, though, attributes any of it to her. He attributes it all to the spirits that he channeled. He says he got all this information from the spirit world, which I'm willing to believe, and therefore I suppose it's possible that he hasn't made the connection that everything he believes is from Alice Bailey himself yet. He may have never noticed that what the spirits told him was word for word Alice Bailey and or theosophy. Alice Bailey was a disciple of the Luciferian theosophist H.P. Blavatsky. She praised Blavatsky in the acknowledgement page of her work, A Treatise on Cosmic Fire, when she stated that the book was, quote, dedicated with gratitude to Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, that great disciple who lighted her in the East and brought the light to Europe and America in 1875, unquote. Alice Bailey never claimed to write any of her 24 books, but rather that the Tibetan spirit guide Shual Kool wrote them. In other words, Bailey was channeling the spirit. Foster Bailey, Alison Bailey's husband, stated in his book, Running God's Plan, that modern esotericism is a new phenomenon in the Western world, pioneered by the Tibetan teacher Shual Kool. Working with H.P. Bavatsky, again this time working with Alison Bailey, the same master teacher, has provided the interim teaching needed for conscious entry into the new Aquarian age. The study of this new teaching in the books published under the name of Alice Bailey is producing a revival of esotericism and a new technique for self-development, this time with the selfless goal of world service. Alice Bailey founded the Lucifer Publishing Company in 1920, but the name changed to Lucius Trust in 1922. Terry Melanson from ConspiracyArchive.com stated the following on how Lucius Trust is run. Lucius Trust is run through an international board of trustees whose membership is said to have included John D. Rockefeller, Norman Cousins, Robert S. McNamara, Thomas Watson Jr., IBN former U.S. Ambassador to Moscow, Henry Clausen, Grand Commander of the Supreme Council, 33rd Degree, Southern District, Scottish Rite, and Henry Kissinger. This would then tie Bailey's influential occult organization into the international conspiracy of elitists, including the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderbergs, and the Trilateral Commission. Many of these people are involved in tax-exempt foundations. These foundations have massively altered life in the United States over the last few decades. The following gives an example of how these men and these organizations are trying to alter education in the United States and through many other similar organizations in other countries around the world. The story you are about to hear represents a missing piece in the puzzle of modern history. Without this knowledge, many contemporary events are simply beyond understanding. You are about to hear a man tell you that the major tax-exempt foundations of this land, since at least 1945, have been operating to promote a hidden agenda. And that agenda has nothing to do with the surface appearance of charity, good works, or philanthropy. The man who tells this story is none other than Mr. Norman Dodd, who in 1954 was the staff director of the Congressional Special Committee to Investigate Tax-Exempt Foundations, sometimes referred to as the Reese Committee, in recognition of its chairman, Congressman Carol Reese. Mr. Dodd, you have spoken before about uh, some interesting things that were discovered by Catherine Casey at the Carnegie Endowment. Can you tell us that story, please? Yes, I'm glad to, Mr. Griffin. Um, this experience that you have just referred to came about in response to a letter which I had written to the 
Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, asking certain questions and gathering certain information. And um, uh, on, uh, on the arrival of that letter, Dr. Johnson, who was then president of the Carnegie Endowment, telephoned me and said, did I ever come up to New York? And I said, yes, I did, more or less each weekend. And he said, well, when you're next here, will you drop in and see us? Which I did. And again, on arrival at the office of the endowment, I found myself in the presence of Dr. Joseph Johnson, the, the president, who was a successor to Alger Hiss, two vice presidents and their own counsel, a partner in the firm of Sullivan and Cromwell. And Dr. Johnson said, after, again, amenities, Mr. Dodd, we have your letter. We can answer all those questions, but it would be a great deal of trouble. And we have a counter-suggestion. And our counter-suggestion is that if you can spare a member of your staff for two weeks and send that member up to New York, we will give to that member a room in the library and the minute books of this foundation since its inception. And we think that whatever you want to find out or the Congress wants to find out will be obvious from those minutes. What could possibly be wrong with foundations? They do so much good. Well, in the face of that sincere conviction of Catherine's, I went out of my way not to prejudice her in any way. But I did explain to her that she couldn't possibly cover 50 years of handwritten minutes in two weeks. So she would have to do what we call spot reading. And I blocked out certain periods of time to concentrate on. And off she went to New York. She came back at the end of two weeks with the following in the way of on, on dictaphone belts. We are now at the year 1908 which was the year that the Carnegie began operations. And in that year, the trustees, meeting for the first time, raised a specific question, which they discuss throughout the balance of the year in a very learned fashion. And the question is, is there any means known more effective than war assuming you wish to alter the life of an entire people. And they conclude that no, no, no more effective means than war to that end is known to humanity. And finally, of course, we are, <clears throat> the war is over. At that time, their interest shifts over to preventing what they call a reversion of life in the United States to what it was prior to 1914 when World War I broke out. And they arrive at that point, they come to the conclusion that to prevent a reversion, we must control education in the United States. And they realize that that's a pretty big task. So it's, to them, it is too big for them alone, so they approach the Rockefeller Foundation with the suggestion that that portion of education, which is, could be considered domestic, be handled by the Rockefeller Foundation, and that portion, which is international, should be handled by the endowment. And they then decide that the key to the success of these two operations lay in the, an alteration of the teaching of American history. Alice Bailey stated in the externalization of the hierarchy, educators and psychologists of vision in every country must be mobilized and the pattern of things to come for the children must be intelligently determined. This will have to be done on an international scale and with the wisdom which comes from a grasp of intermediate needs and a far-sighted vision. 
Ladies and gentlemen, Lucius Trust is no fringe group. Anyone who has studied the New World Order realizes the power that is held by men such as John D. Rockefeller, Henry Kissinger, and through organizations such as the Council on Foreign Relations. These men are heavily involved with and have set up in many occasions these tax exempt foundations which undermine the national sovereignty of many nations and draw us closer to a one world religion enforced by a one world government. Now this is from Alice Bailey. She wrote the externalization of the hierarchy and she was head <coughs> of Lucia's Trust. <coughs> and Lucia's Trust, as so many of you already know, is a publishing company. Uh, uh, Lucia's Publishing is a publishing company for the United Nations. And uh, <coughs> it was originally known as Lucifer Publishing and Lucifer Trust. And Alice Bailey created 140 New Age religions. And she worked for the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare in 1957, establishing educational goals that are now being implemented in the United States. For instance, Global 2000. And she, and she writes that Freemasonry will be the reli uh, universal religion. Other uh, New Age leaders, like Benjamin Krim, also say the same thing, that Freemasonry will be the new universal religion. And she says, that between the church and esoteric groups and Freemasonry, there is no disassociation between all of these. So if you're a member of a group like Freemasonry, they want you to work towards this goal of one world government and the new age the, that they call the Great Plan. And Alice Bailey tells us how they're going to do this. She says, by means of the educational work of the world, the Great Lord who she refers to in this book as Lucifer, seeks to reach those of the intelligent public who cannot be reached by means of ceremonial and symbolism as in masonry, or by religious means and rituals as in the church. It touches the masses and those in whom the intelligent aspects predominate. What she's telling us here is, and we'll read it again in this next one, is the three main channels through which the preparation for the New Age is going on might be regarded as the church, the Masonic fraternity, and the educational field. We're going to get them in the churches to, uh, to bring in this New Age, but not everybody goes to church. So we'll teach them in the fraternities, but not everybody goes to a Masonic lodge. So then the safety net for it all is education. We're in a period is of what is called externalization of the hierarchy. They're taking what was done in secret a uh, hundred years ago and they're externalizing what was done by the hierarchy in secret into society. As we have already seen, the conspiracy is spiritual in nature. Probably the most important book written by Alice Bailey was Externalization of the Hierarchy. This book details the setting up of a new world order. But this is not the new world order that many in the truth movement are aware of. Instead, it is a new world order that will rise out of the ashes of the old world order. The old ways will be done away with in the new world order. Evil in Bailey's writings is associated with having, quote, a nationalistic, separative, or isolationist spirit, unquote. When one compares the new world order envisioned by Lucius Trust and the United Nations and compares it with the Venus Project, the similarities are unmistakable. The Venus Project, with its ties to the United Nations, has put forward through the Zeitgeist films, the utopian dream of the elite. This has been envisioned at least since the time of Plato and was described by people such as the Rosicrucian, Sir Francis Bacon. The dream of the elite is to recreate Atlantis. Alice Bailey stated in the externalization of the hierarchy, if this work is soundly done, then a world unity can be established which will produce right human relations, a sound world politic, a united spiritual effort and an economic sharing which will bring to an end all competition and the present uneven distribution of the necessities of life. In the future, the contributory factor in life must be emphasized and developed and the good of the entire family of nations must be substituted for the good of one nation or a group of nations. 
The resources of the entire planet must be shared collectively, and it must be increasingly realized that the products of the earth, the gifts of the soil, the intellectual heritage of the nations belong to the whole of mankind and to no one nation exclusively. Speaking in America's assignment with destiny, Manly P. Hall stated the following, This vision must be communicated, it must be extended throughout human society until humanity redeems itself by the experience of enlightenment. And here's from another Freemason, high ranking, Foster Bailey, and he says, little as it may be realized by the unthinking Mason who is interested only in the outer aspects of the craftwork, the whole fabric of Masonry may be regarded as an externalization of that inner spiritual group whose members down the ages have been custodians of the plan and as those to whom has been committed the working out of the will of God for the race of men. They assist at the unfolding of the consciousness of the candidate until the time comes when he can enter into light and in his turn become a light bearer, one of the Illuminati who can assist the Lodge on high in bringing humanity to light. The hierarchy is also being externalized through media giants such as Oprah. That what I believe is that Jesus came to show us Christ consciousness. Alice Bailey stated the following, Humanity has been brought in consciousness increasingly near to the spiritual centers of love and life and has been stimulated to make spiritual progress, to awaken to the light within, to unfold the Christ consciousness and to find the path of light which leads to divinity. The inspiration came out of a brilliant record that she wrote, Born This Way, and what's actually happening, as you saw the vessel, is that she's incubating. And it was necessary to incubate her for a certain amount of time because tonight she's actually birthing a new race. We're birthing a new race that uh, doesn't have the ability to hate or judgment in their DNA. So she's actually incubating right now. So she goes through that process. And um, it's really happening. We're birthing a new race tonight. She is the biggest pop star in the world. Her latest song that you heard her fans, her little monster singing down there, Born This Way, already topping the Billboard charts. Lady Gaga had everyone talking at the Grammys where she took home another three trophies on Sunday. And she is here this morning to talk about a lot of things, but also about the work that she is doing all around the world to help so many others. Take a look. What do you think it is about about your music, about this, and I know we have to wait until the full album to come out in uh, the latter part of May, but what is it about it, do you think? You know, Born This Way is so much bigger than me. It is just, it's not about me at all, really. The, the song, when I wrote it, I just knew it was destined to reach so many people all over the world. And you know, it, because I wanted to have a rebirth, and mm -hmm. I think the universe needs to have a rebirth. Alice Bailey stated the following, In the externalization of the hierarchy, the slow and careful formation of the new group of world servers is indicative of the crisis they are overseeing or ushering in the new age and are present at the birth pangs of the new civilization and the coming into manifestation of a new race, a new culture and a new world outlook. Later in the book she goes on to say that, I tell you that humanity is everywhere spiritually minded and that the new race, the coming civilization, and the new age culture will be found throughout the world, the universal inheritance of the human race. She also stated that the present world order, which is today largely disorder, can be so modified and changed that the new world and the new race of men can gradually come into being. While many believe that the new world order is just about a police state, the fact remains that they are planning for the coming chaos. The most important item in the agenda for the New World Order is unity through the New World's spirituality. These are times of tumultuous change. The 20th century order is history, and the forces of globalization are pushing all of the economies of the world more closely together, and all of the citizens of the world more closely together, with their great diversity of religious faiths. Global interdependence, therefore, is a reality. And faith is inextricably linked to that interdependence. The new global order brings new uncertainties and new insecurities too. 
and that has happened most recently in the form of financial turbulence and credit problems whose origins are clearly international but whose full implications are still unfolding. And when I said the words New World Order, they, they, I, they turned a couple of heads. <laughs> a little shocking, the rem reminiscence of uh, scary George Bush days. Many liberal organizations, including the United Nations, are pursuing the development of a one world religious organization. Today, on the United Nations 55th anniversary, CBN News reporter Wendy Griffith takes a look at what's behind this push for a global religious voice. After a while, the drums, chants, and prayers representing many of the world's leading religions all started to sound alike, somehow losing their flavor in a melting pot of spiritual soup. The first ever Millennium World Peace Summit of Religious and Spiritual Leaders took place at the United Nations in August, and some believe it marked the first major step toward a movement to usher in a global spiritual body that may one day speak for all religions. Robert McGinnis with the Family Research Council says it appears the hidden agenda is to unite people under one religious organization so they will peacefully accept UN goals such as population control, abortion rights, and one world government. Instead of all these different gods, maybe there's one God who manifests himself and reveal himself in different ways to different people. You know, what about that, huh? CNN founder and billionaire Ted Turner was the honorary chair of the World Religion Summit. Turner, known for his critical views on biblical Christianity, promoted the New Age concept that there are many ways to heaven. The thing that disturbed me is that uh, my religious Christian sect uh, was very intolerant, not intolerant of religious freedom for other people, but um, we thought we were the, they thought that we were the only ones going to heaven. Well, supporters of a global religious voice have come down hard on evangelical Christians who refuse to adopt their New Age agenda. Although the URI says it is not a religion, critics say it does preach a theology, a theology that teaches acceptance and diversity among all faiths. Those who push for a global religious organization believe that all religions, while different on the surface, are each valid pathways to God. Oh, you're going to be united. There's no doubt about that. I'm suggesting to you that the things that are suggested in Zeitgeist is just a ghost of what's coming. It's only the beginnings of a mindset that can only be possible after a huge amount of turmoil. The chaos that's going to ensue is going to be on such a level as to be able to bring in a vastly different system. One that will be a hyper-socialistic state that nobody will disagree with. How can that happen? How can that happen? It doesn't matter if the war was absolutely brutal how can that happen when the new new world order comes you will think it is a good idea you will not believe that it is what you've been fighting you think that we are a small group of people that that know about the new world order that's that's not true we are a large group the mainstream does believe what the mainstream is told to believe, and that is even more dangerous because they will be introduced to this new paradigm, which is going to be oddly sim similar to the vast majority of the paradigm of the truth movement. They're going to believe that aliens seeded us by genetic engineering. They're going to believe in a utopia based on the idea that, that we are nothing more than the products of genetic engineering from an alien race. There may be a religious dogma associated with it, but I will tell you this, there will be unity. We will all be united in our new understanding of our origins. We will willingly do what the New World Order has been trying to do the whole time, which is get rid of our borders, national sovereignty, those things are just holding us back. We will, we will be united in our hatred against Christians because, after all, they were wrong. They, and, and they were, 
they are the problem. They are the ones holding us back. They are the ones who, who all these wars and all this turmoil is because of. Let me ask you something. What if I could tell you that that general idea has been provided for you and none of it's true? They have not only instigated the coming chaos, they have planned for its aftermath, and they plan to use you to rebel. They plan to use this world revolution to unite all peoples. Alice Bailey stated steps towards a new world order. For step one, she stated the following, the new world order must meet the immediate need and not be an attempt to satisfy some distant, idealistic vision. In point two, she states, the New World Order must be appropriate to a world which has passed through a destructive crisis and to humanity which is badly shattered by the experience. The New World Order must lay the foundation for a future world order which will be possible only after a time of recovery, of reconstruction and of rebuilding. The Bible predicts a man will come before Jesus' second coming claiming to be God. This man is the prophesied Antichrist, the Christ of the New Age. But first, through the externalization of the hierarchy, they are preparing humanity to worship this man. We have been told by Satanists what to believe about Jesus. Does anybody see anything wrong with that? And the only thing that can stop them is the authority that I believe was given to us 2,000 years ago. Now, if that's true, then the New World Order, if they are Satanists, has every reason in the world to discredit Jesus. But faced with all this, what should one do? If the battle is spiritual, then we must have victory spiritually. There is only one way we can have victory. My main advice would be to anybody that starts to see these things taking place and starts to realize that, hey, the message of the Bible is true, is to realize that we've seen a lot of bad news. There's a lot of ugly things happening. I mean, there, the world has a spiritual cancer called sin and rebellion against God. But the good news is, and thank God we have the good news, the Greek words euangelion, the reason there's bad news is, and the reason there's good news is because it was first bad news. The bad news is that man is sinful and rebellion against God's rule in his life, rebellious against the Lordship of Jesus Christ. As many people who have researched the Bible have seen, who have actually looked at its claims and dug into it, they realize one thing. The more they research, the more they test, the less they doubt. But it's all in vain if you do not accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. For whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, the Bible says. It's that simple. If you truly believe in your heart, if you truly believe, you'll have a change of heart. You'll see yourself as a sinner. I put by the grace of God. You can't work for this, it's grace. We're saved by grace. Grace means divine favor. You didn't do anything to earn it. All you've got to do is believe on the finished work of Jesus Christ and you're saved by grace, by divine favor, by the grace of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Before you leave this film, before you go on with your research into the New World Order, who is he? Can you really see that the Bible has predicted all these things, but walk away and not accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? But if you are in Christ, live for him. And the Bible says, a uh, very popular verse, but a lot of times people don't quote the rest of it, which shows you that there's a choice. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It goes on to say that, that he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. But then it says, this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, Jesus Christ. But men love darkness more than light, for their deeds were evil. Everyone that hates the light refuses to come to the light, lest his deeds be exposed. But he that loves the light, he that loves the Lord, comes to the light to show that his deeds are rotten in God. So there's condemnation. The condemnation is for those who reject the message of the cross. In fact, somebody who hears the message of the New World Order and the coming Antichrist, and says, yeah, it's wrong and everything else, 
yet refuses to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and bow down to him and follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is the same type of rebel as the Antichrist himself. Because Jesus warns us that broad is the way to destruction and many there be that go thereat and narrow is the way that leads to eternal life and few there be that go thereat. But it doesn't matter because the bottom line is when we come back to earth with Jesus we are just the cheering section, amen? He is coming back when, when that 200 million man army surrounds Jerusalem, he's going to come down and open up his mouth and that two-edged sword is going to come out and those 200 million soldiers are going to become crispy critters just like that. Folks, don't get nervous about this New World Order stuff. I read the last chapter. We win. This is the time, if there ever was a time in the history of the world, this is it, to forget the cares of the world and reach others for Christ. What we talk about here is strengthening our own belief and faith in the words of God, knowing that our faith is built on facts. But the most important thing is to take this book and apply it to the lives of men and women so that they see themselves as lost sinners on their way to hell and fall on the mercy of the finished work of our Savior, trusting Him and Him alone for their eternal destiny, their forgiveness, and their relationship with God. If we don't do that, we can be right on everything else we do, and we have absolutely failed. So now is the time to come to Christ and receive Him right now. The Word of God is simple. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That you go into the book of Jude and you read the warnings of the false teachers uh, that Jude warns about. You know, uh, certain men crept in unawares, ungodly men who were before of old ordained to their condemnation. And uh, Jude says specifically uh, that he says, These speak evil of what they know not, but what they know naturally, their natural wisdom, as brute beasts in those things they corrupt themselves. Cried out, I don't care what anybody thinks, I don't care what anybody says, Jesus come into my life. I, I'm not afraid to be against that which is wrong, but I far more would rather be for, remembered for being for that which is right than that which is wrong.